so let's hope the tablet works a little better now. Yeah, so we learn about how to clip triangles, but um, some most of the cases we're dealing with triangles, of course, but sometimes we also have polygons and um, we can, of course, split them into triangles now and then do the clipping with the triangles like we learned. But of course, we can also, uh, there are also algorithms to uh, clip arbitrary polygons and we will see two of them now. One of them is the so-called Sutherland-Hodgman algorithm. And the basic idea of that algorithm is, uh, so those these two algorithms are not in the book, but um, yeah, you sh from my, one of the slides that I have here, I think you should be able to, to understand it. And if not, you can just uh, Google them. You will find information about this online or look up some other books, which is something that I always encourage anyhow. Yeah, so uh, we want to, uh, the, the basic idea of the sutherland hodgman algorithm is that we clip the polygon subsequently against every hyperplane. So, um, oh, I forgot to say that. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the slides here, I always use the verb, word hyperplane because what I'm explaining here, I usually just draw two images because they are easier to understand and easier to uh, explain it on than a 3D image on a 2D display but um, they also usually extend to 3D and uh, in fact uh, it would in theory also work in 4D but 4D of course we cannot visualize and that's why uh, in this context we're always talking about a hyperplane which then basically means in 1D, uh, sorry, in 2D it's a, a line and in 3D it's a plane. Yeah, and that's why hyperplane. So we, we the idea is we take for example this one first and then we cut off this part then we take this one here then we cut off this part and then we look at the others and then we see there is nothing here so we're done and then we have our polygon our clipped polygon which is the dark blue one and uh, the single steps to go through this are illustrated here how to do this we start for example with the upper here so we take this plane here we extend this upper side to a plane or a line in 2D, of course. Then we start uh, at one vertex of the polygon and follow the path of the polygon. So we start, for example, at P0 and then we follow the path of the polygon until we reach it again. Here, P0. And why we do that and we cross the clipping plane that we have here, or the clipping line in this case, we create a new node here, which is here and here. Still doesn't like me. And um, then we wait, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. What? My notes here are a little confusing. Um, yeah, and then we have these new notes here and then we can cut this off. And then we do the same here, of course, and then we have our new note here. And then we, no. We go here, then we get this intersection here. We go here and then we get this intersection point here and then we can cut off this part here and then we're done. Of course, we have to, when we write an algorithm, we would also check these two here, but we see there is nothing there. So we have our final polygon. So this is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Only problem is it doesn't work all the time because if we have a case like this, we get a degenerated polygon. If you apply the algorithm to this, you will see that you end up getting a polygon that goes from here to here, to here, and then back again. So this is uh, an exercise to apply this algorithm to this. And the point is just that when you walk around the border of the polygon that you kind of miss uh, this part here when you go back. So you do not cut it off here into two so, uh, new polygons, but you get one degenerated polygon. And this is why we use often the weiler atherton algorithm, which seems a little more complicated, but is actually pretty straightforward. And the basic idea of that is that we create a graph that contains 
a graph that contains nodes for all vertices of the polygon, for all corners of the few frustum, and for the intersection points. And then we add edges between those nodes that allow us to extract the clipped polygons from this graph very easily. So let's see how we can do this. The algorithm to build the graph is first we start by making uh, a graph which three these three groups of vertices. First the polygon vertices. So if you look here we have a polygon vertices from P0 to P8. So these are here polygon on the left P0 bis till t P8. Then we create the clipping region vertices which are the green ones here in the image, R0 till R3. And then we create intersection vertices. So ignore the color for now. This is light and dark red. I0 till I3. Also, they are in a special order here, which you should also um, ignore. Um, I've drawn them already because then the graph looks nicer uh, in that order. Um, but these are exactly these four intersection points that we have here. And now we want to create the edges. And we create the edges by walking along the boundary, walking along the boundary of the polygon. So we take the polygon, we walk along the boundary again till we're back at the beginning. And each time we pass an intersection point, we add an edge, and now we distinguish between outgoing intersections and incoming intersections. So an outgoing intersection is when I go from inside of the view frustum to the outside. So this is an outgoing intersection, and an incoming intersection is then, of course, straightforward, the one when we go from the outside into the view frustum. So this is an incoming intersection, and this, again, is an outgoing intersection point. This is an incoming intersection point, and now you see why I have used a different color here to indicate them because it's important that we uh, get this information for later when we want to extract the solution from it. Now the last thing we have to insert are the edges for the uh, for the clipping region. So when we walk along the boundary of the clipping region now and again we add an edge every time we hit a vertex of the uh, clipping region vertex, but also one of the intersection vertices. So let's do this here. We start from R0, then we come to R1. From R1, we come to I0. From I0, we come to I1. From I1, we come to R2. From R2, we come to I2. From I2, we come to I3. From I3, we come to R3. That's here. And from R3, we come to R0 again. Now let's add the others that we, uh, when we walk along the polygon. We start by P0, we come to I0. We already, I already said that this is an outgoing intersection. Then we come to P1. From P1, we follow to P2, P3, till I3. So P2, P3, and then we come to I3. From I3, we come to P4, P5. P4, then P5. Then we walk across I2. Then we come to uh, P6. And from P6 to P7, P8, and then to I1. And from I1, we come back to uh, um, P0. Let's draw it this, no, this way. Yeah, now you see also why I changed the order here and not from I0 to I3, because it's uh, better to draw now. Yeah, let's see if that is correct. Yeah, that looks pretty much correct. Good, so now we have our graph. And uh, now I claim that we can easily see the solution from there. And this is then uh, when uh, 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 how we can extract these, these clipped polygons. What we do is for each outgoing intersection vertex, we pick one of the outgoing intersection vertices and we walk along the boundary of 
the clipping region and report every vertex along the way. So we start at an outgoing intersection vertex, so for example that one, and we walk along the boundary of the clipping region, so we walk in that direction and report every vertex along the way. So this is the first vertex that we report and then we see when we have an incoming intersection vertex we continue to walk on the boundary of the polygon, not on the clipping region, but we switch to walking on the polygon, so we go inside now. Then we report this here, there's nothing special to do here, and then we come back, and this is then here, continue changing from polygon boundary to clipping region boundary, and the other way around, at outgoing and incoming intersection vertices until we reach the starting vertex and this is the case that we have right now here. So we are the starting vertex so we know that we have here our first clipped polygon then we keep walking here till we find the next outgoing intersection vertex which is this one then we do again the same so here we switch to go inside of the polygon go here and then we report all these and then we get all these four vertices from the from this other clipped polygon. And uh, yeah, then we're done because we have no further outgoing intersection vertex here. Now the uh, the thing here that I just read, we, we never use that, that we switch from clipping region to uh, boundary to polygon boundary. That is not in this simple example, but if you have something like this, Okay, that should be a triangle. So if you start here and then you go in here, then of course here you don't go outside but you have to continue here then, you have to switch then from walking along the polygon to walk along the, uh, the clipping region and then till you're here, then you, oh no, till you're here and then you go in again, then you go on the outside again and you go in again and then you're back at where you started. So you see and think about we're doing this with polygons, so we can have much more complex uh, uh, polygons or, or shapes here. And then of course it can happen that you are at the, at the clipping region constantly switching between those. Yeah, so this is uh, yeah pretty much a pretty simple straightforward uh, algorithm. It's also, yeah, it's pretty mechanical. You just have to learn it. Nevertheless, there are often mistakes in the exams. So, just as a hint, this is a good exam question. Good. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we know now how we can do a clipping for triangles and for polygons, and that allows us to solve these kind of cases here. It basically also allows us to solve this kind of case here, because we can just, in that case, we will see that all the four vertices, if we test the triangle against the uh, clipping, uh, the, view frustum, we will see that uh, all points are outside of the view frustum, so we can throw it away. But of course, if you think about it, you have a huge model, like for example, a whole city, and you're just looking down one street, then checking all the triangles of your model, of your scene, is kind of uh, ridiculous, and it's an overkill. So we want to decide before the clipping if we really uh, need to draw those triangles or not, or if we can remove them before we enter the pipeline and this is then called culling. And um, yeah, doing this for individual triangles is very expensive. This is why there is the approach of so-called bounding volume culling where we group uh, single objects like triangles that are somehow contained and next to each other into a larger volume. Again, think about a city, you could for example uh, include all buildings into a house and then you clip the whole house instead of each triangle that models this house. And um, then, uh, yeah, so, so then you just have to check the volume and if the volume is not inter intersecting with the frustum, then of course you can remove all the objects that are in this volume and you don't have to do a, a clipping test. Now, uh, this is called an conservative test because of course it can happen that 
the volume does intersect with the few frustum, but the objects in the volume do not intersect with it. But this is a conservative test, and that's what it's meant by conservative test, so it is more on the safe side. So if there is an intersection with this, in this case, the sphere, then they, uh, uh, you do the, the test. Now, um, <clears throat> of course, this works as efficient as possible if the, the more, no, the the more the volume matches the actual shape of the objects that are included, the more efficient this works. But on the other hand, the more this shape, uh, the, the uh, certain shapes are then of course more difficult to test, which is why very often spheres are used because spheres can be tested very easily. And we can see this by looking at the uh, at the, uh, again, the implicit equation of a sphere, which is here, and we have, a, uh, not a sphere, a plane, sorry, implicit equation of a plane, and we have a sphere defined by a center and a radius, and uh, then uh, we just have to check this condition here, if this vector c minus vector a times vector n divided by the length of vector n, error missing here, if that is larger than the radius, then we can, uh, we have to, to, to check that. And if it's larger than the radius, then the sphere does not intersect with the free frustum. And uh, if you don't see this immediately, I, uh, I have drawn some, some uh, images here. So we have our plane defined by a vector A that points to the plane and the normal vector. So this is just our vector A to uh, a point on the plane. And then we have the normal vector n. So this, what I draw right now, is the plane with the normal vector and the vector n uh, a that defines the, the position of the plane in the space. And then we have here in this formula this vector c minus a. So that is c is the center of the sphere and c minus a. Now if you think of what is going on today. I think I need a new computer. All right. Um, so if, if you think about this, if you have a sphere here, C, with a certain radius, then you can imagine that if the radius is, if this distance here is smaller than the radius, then of course the sphere extends into the few frustum. If it is not, then it is outside of the few frustum. Now, the difficult thing here is to see, of course, why, how does the radius relate to this C minus A and this uh, scalar product that we have here. But if you look at this image, you see that here is a right angle and here is a right angle. So this distance here is exactly the same as the distance here. Now, this distance here is exactly the projection of the vector C minus A onto the normal vector, and we learned that in one of the first lectures that the projection of a vector is defined by the cosine of the angle between the vector times the length of this vector, and this is then this projection, in this case it's P uh, V, so the P doesn't have an arrow here, so this is a scalar value, don't uh, confuse that here. So this here is exactly this projection. Now, if you look at the equation that we have here, this here is the same as what I wrote here. If you do the scalar product of the vectors, you end up with this, and this falls out, and then you have exactly this projection here. So this is exactly this distance here, which if you draw it as a circle with a, as a circle or a sphere with a radius, is obvious then why this has to be larger than R. All right, so we can do the uh, frustum culling with the, this uh, volume uh, test. Um, another approach for culling or another situation where we want to apply culling is so-called occlusion culling. So for example, think about you have a large triangle here. So you don't see this sphere here, uh, this, this, this object here then of course it would make sense to throw them away because before you draw them and that is this so-called occlusion culling. Um, I will not discuss this and also in the 
in the book it's not discussed because the most important part uh, uh, form of culling is indeed backface culling which is what I want to go to more into detail. Backface culling is uh, of course um, removing of backfaces and backfaces are the faces of objects that yeah like the name says that you're looking at the back so if you have an object like this the black ones are the front faces that you see from your camera here from your eye and you don't see the red stuff here because you see only the back of it so the the name back faces comes from uh, the idea of having a closed polygon or a closed shape and if that is is closed then of course you only see the front faces you can never see the back faces but you see this sometimes in games when you like walk into uh, then there is an object and then if it's bad program and you walk into it and then you suddenly see something dark and that is exactly then the situation that you walk somewhere in here but the back faces are not modeled and then it's why it suddenly becomes becomes dark so not in the modern games but when I liked when I used to play games and years ago then we still had this and then suddenly I had this mistake and when I learned graphics then then I realized why we have this mistake because yeah you just don't model the back face because you don't need them but if it's so programmed that you can actually walk into a closed object then you suddenly stand in front of something that is not there because it's not modeled yeah so the uh Let's look at an example. Let's look at a closed object like a cube. A cube, uh, when you model a cube with triangle, how many do you need? How much? For the whole cube? 12, yeah, exactly. But you can only see at a maximum how many? Six, exactly. So the maximum that you see is six, the minimum that you see is two. We are looking directly from the front and the only other option that you have is four when you're looking from the side but you don't see the top and the bottom and that means of course with back face culling you can save a lot of operation the least you can save is eight but you can also even save uh, 10 or wait what maximum is six yeah why did i write four six six eight here we go yeah so um so these are the the, the triangles then we have to draw so the uh, idea is of course why it's called back face culling if the camera faces the back side of a triangle we doesn't need to draw it so the question is of course when we have our camera here our eye vector eye vector e and our gaze vector how do we know if we're looking at the front or at the back but now comes into play what I said earlier with the normal vector we know that the normal vector or we have the convention that the normal vector always points to the outside I mean for the for the shading we need the normals to point outside anyhow and now it comes into uh, into place that if we're if we are uh, what I said within a positive and a negative space that the space where the normal points to is always the positive space and this is now finally the proof that uh, when I realized it this morning that I, I uh, it's not in the right order I, I didn't want to change it because usually when you change made last minute change you screw up even more so I just decided to to leave it that way but uh, yeah this is now the proof um, it's basically just a generalization of this proof that you had on the first or the second tutorial sheet but just for for 3d which is nothing different because uh, we just write vectors and say they have three coordinates instead of two but I think it's also a good uh, repetition to to understand it so we have the implicit equation of a of a plane we can also write that like this way we had that also before that we do the scalar product because this is a constant factor so we get here uh, a scalar value and uh, now what we want to yeah um, oh sorry um, to find so this is the vector p0 that points to the plane we can write it like that and now we say that this is a positive subspace so every f of p here is larger than zero and here is a negative so it's smaller than zero and the proof is if we take a random vector that points to 
the same side as a normal vector. We can draw the normal vector like this because it's a vector, so it's not fixed to a certain location. And then we can describe this line or this vector by um, a linear combination of a vector p dash, which is on the plane. So this here is a right angle and a vector lambda times n. So that should be clear from the image. This is just a linear, a linear combination of these two vectors. Now if we put this in the plane equation, so this is our point P, if we put that in a plane equation, we get this here. If we then move the D from here to here, we we'll see that this here is exactly f of the vector p dash but that is zero because we have chosen it to lie on the plane now this here is obviously larger than zero oh, no, not, it is larger not equal to zero because it's a normal vector so if it would be equal to zero we would have only zeros there so the null vector so that cannot be it's a normal vector so at least one of the coefficients has to be larger than zero, uh, larger than zero. So this is larger than zero. And also the lambda must be larger than zero because P and N are on the same side. And if lambda would be negative, then P would be on the other side. So lambda is also larger than zero. But if we have zero plus something that is larger than zero, then this means that our F of P is also larger than zero. And this is exactly what we wanted to prove, that any random vector that points to the same side of the normal vector is points to, uh, uh, is in a, in a positive space, that is f of p is larger than zero. And now we have to prove the same, same for the negative side, which I'll leave as an exercise because it's really just writing the same thing down with uh, on the negative side, but as I said earlier, if you have weaknesses in calculations and stuff, this is a good opportunity to practice. All right, so now we also have the, the, the formal proof of what I claimed before. Yeah, and sorry again for mixing up the order. So we can now remove the back sides of our cube because we just have to put in, if we have a camera here, we just have to put in the camera into the equation of the plane and then we see if it's positive, it's a front-facing plane, so if we draw it, if it's back a negative, it's, we see the back face of it, or we don't see it because we would look at the back face, which is by a closed object, not visible, so we can remove it, we can do a culling here. So this is just a simple test, so we can draw here, in this case, the six triangles. But of course, this is now the big question that remains, what do we do here? Because even if it is a front-facing triangle, we cannot see it because another cube is in front of it. And uh, this is now this so-called hidden surface removal. Um, the most simple, most straightforward approach this, of this is called the painter's algorithm, which basically says we just start to draw the objects from the back to the front. So we start by the object that is furthest away, the blue cube, then we draw the yellow cube, and then we draw the green cube, and then of course we see that they are all ordered in correct way, or they are all drawn in the correct way, and we can all see them like we would see them in reality. Only problem with this is, of course, it doesn't always work that easy, because we cannot always create a correct order of objects. For example, in the last case, you will not be able to define an order that is unique and allows you to draw the objects from the back to the front that ends up with this kind of visualization. And of course, if the, opt if the triangles are intersecting, we can also not draw them. If they're intersecting, or also for, for, the, for the left case, we could, of course, split the triangles, but of course, that would be, uh, would be a lot of effort and would be uh, not very efficient. So what we use instead is a so-called set buffer. There are other approaches in the old book in a second edition, there is even a whole chapter about hidden surface removal, which talks a lot about binary space partition trees, but that is something, uh, it's an algorithmic solution for a problem that 
no one basically uses usually because the set buffer is so much faster and uh, supported by hardware that it's just uh, pointless to, to do this. And in the new book, they actually removed this chapter and hidden surface removal is now part of the pipeline uh, chapter, just for the people who work with the second, book, uh, second edition that you don't wonder or are surprised why suddenly information is not there anymore. Good, or why I'm not covering this information that is in your book. Good, yeah, so the set buffer is uh, basically just some additional storage that we have where we store death information. And uh, like I said, usually this is done in, in hardware, but there are also software implementations for this. So uh, for, for games, of course, you would usually use the hardware solution. But for example, for, uh, for Pixar, when they're rendering their movies, then of course they don't have the real-time restriction. They can take more time to calculate uh, a single frame of their movie. And uh, then they use a, a software implementation of the, of the set buffer. But they also use a set buffer. They don't use uh, other approaches. And the, the idea is really extremely simple, pretty straightforward. We have a screen with pixels and we have a frame buffer that uh, gives us color information of the pixels that we, of the color that we want to draw on the pixels on the screen. And now we take just another buffer of the same size. So this is, uh, I think it was called an X and Y. And then we have the same here, the same size here. And then we just store death information here. And the information that we store here is the death information of the closest object that we have drawn to a specific to a specific point of time. So what we do is every time we want to draw a pixel at a certain position, we see, we check the set buffer. If the value in the set buffer is smaller, uh, no, if the new value is smaller than the value in the set buffer, then we wait yeah if this is the case then we draw it i was just a little confused um we have to be careful here if we look in the positive or negative set direction i think this is the positive direction here i'm i'm sticking always with the book because i think it's too confusing when i do that but Sometimes even that confuses me. So uh, yeah, we're looking at the positive set direction. That means if the set value is smaller, so let's write this down to make it clear. If the set value is smaller, the object is closer to me. That means I write this value into the set buffer. So if, for example, I have here this uh, from, from the red triangle here, this value in there, and now I'm looking at this pixel from the blue triangle, and I have this value in here, let's say this is uh, from the red triangle, this is, I don't know, 7, and from the blue triangle this is uh, 3, and then I have 7 here from the red triangle, then I come to this pixel from the blue triangle, then I see this is smaller, so I know this object is closer to me, then I remove this part here and write the new value in there. So I always keep the one of the closest object. That means in the end, when I have all my, my, my values checked, I have always the one value from the closest object in my set buffer. So I have always the lowest, the closest set value there. And that means, uh, and then I can, can draw it always the front, uh, the, the object that is in the front. But that also means, of course, I need to first initialize it with the set max value, which is then the far plane value, of course. And yeah, that way then I can draw it appropriately because I have the lowest set value. Now a comment about the, the position, it's uh, important to keep in mind here what I said last time with the perspective divide. Um, the, uh, for for uh, uh, efficiency reasons, the set values are often stored as non-negative uh, non integer values. And uh, so that means we have a kind of a, a number B. So we have zero till B minus one. These are then the integers that we store in our set buffer. And that means we have to map every coordinate that we have to an interval or a bucket of the size f minus 1 divided by b. Of course, if this is like uh, uh, n, if this is, and this is f, and you have b, 
uh, slots here then of course each slot has can ha uh, covers in your uh, space then uh, f minus n divided by b values so uh, <clears throat> that means we have some could have some precision problems here if the number of buckets or intervals is too small if our b value is too small and also when we do the mapping we have to remember that we do this uh, um, this per, per, uh, perspective projection then what we do is of course we map the points on the near plane to the first bucket we map the points on the far plane to the last bucket but in between we have to remember that we have this function here which well, I don't know why it's called drawn dotted where we basically do this transformation here so you see you remember I, I, I said that uh, uh, last time at the end that the objects that are closer to the eye so this is the eye or in this case then here so you see they are pushed further away and they are pushed closer to each other now if we map that now again linearly into this set buffer bucket we see that the precision increases a lot at the beginning so the objects that are closer to us are handled more precisely whereas here at the end you can run into precision problems because they are mapped the same number of coordinates is mapped to a smaller smaller space so uh, yeah you have this problem here but in most of the cases this actually makes sense because if an object is closer you want it to be drawn more precisely and more accurately if you have imprecision at all you want to have it far away from you of course um, yeah so uh, and uh, the only ways to increase this or to, to change this is of course you can increase b the number of buckets that you have a b is uh, the, if b is the number of buckets then uh, b uh, small b is the is the number of bits you need to describe those buckets if you increase that number of course you increase your precision but usually this is given by the hardware by the api that you use so you're not able to do this the only thing you can do to modify the precision is to modify the near and the far plane because that influences how much values you have to store in one bucket so this is why uh, uh, to illustrate how important it is to set the near and the far plane uh, very precise uh, very, uh, in a reasonable way that matches to the world that you want to model because of course if you you could say yeah I make the near plane as close as possible and the far plane as far away and I draw everything but in practice then your graphic will become ugly because you get this imprecision problem so you have to make a good decision about how to do that all right so we know now how to clip we know how to do culling and we know how to do a correct order drawing which is not illustrated here so if we have one here then we know how to draw them correctly but we still don't know how to do the actual rasterization how to draw those actual pixels because here I actually I used an example where I talked about a pixel in the middle here of this blue triangle but actually here it says that what we do with the set values is that we project only the corners of course of this to the set buffer and for in between we interpolate them so we do not calculate the points in there and then take their set value we take the set values from the corner and then we interpolate with the set values and this is also of course related to the interpolation that we do to create to calculate the color points that we have for the triangle and this is then what we want to do next week good are there any questions no then we're done for today